Okay, well, thanks so much uh, for inviting me, and it's uh, great to be here in beautiful Paris. Um, so I'm going to talk about this genetic landscape, and before I get going, I just want to say that it's, it's all a major collaboration with uh, Brenda Andrews, who's the director of our institute here at the Donnelly Center. And I'm going to try and explain uh, why this graph is a model uh, of the cell. That's basically what I'm going to try and tell you guys. And it's a kind of lab. yeah, it kind of it could be anything, right? Uh, and uh, but you know, here's the model that we have so far. And when you think about it, um, you know, we know a lot about the parts of the cell, but we really don't have a good model for how they're integrated together. And uh, omics, functional genomics, systems biology tries to do that in a quantitative way. And it's, it's, uh, it's not that we're very good at it at this stage, but it's sort of the beginnings, the beginnings of it. And our project has, has kind of contributed to this. So <coughs> I'm going to talk about the budding yeast, uh, which uh, a bunch of us work on here. Uh, Georgiana and David are leaders in the field, and it's a it's a eukaryotic cell, so it's a billion years further evolved beyond uh, prokaryotes, and it's got uh, a nucleus uh, and uh, you know a, a mitochondria with its own DNA. It's got all the goodies that we find in human cells, and so <coughs> it's been a, a major uh, model organism and. In fact, uh, there's a thousand yeast labs around the world, and we all feed data into one big uh, common database that uh, is put together at Stanford by SGD. So yeast has 6,000 genes and um, 16 pairs of chromosomes, and you compare that to a human has 20,000 genes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So it's, it's a pretty sweet little cell. And the yeast community, this international community, there's labs uh, all over Europe, major labs in Japan, um, and of course in North America, and it's expanding to China and India in, uh, uh, rapidly as we speak. Uh, not in Russia. There's nothing in Russia. Don't you think that's weird? Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, the goal is to figure out, and so we've got a graduate student, there's six graduate students in each lab, we've got a graduate student for every single yeast gene, right? And you'd think that we could figure out how this thing works, this cell works, and we could model it, but uh, we're so far from it, because, it's because we have to figure out how they're all connected to one another and how they're talking to each other and the dynamics of it all, and uh, that is way beyond the, capa or, uh, uh, the capability of uh, the yeast community, but any community studying any form of life. But just to give you a, a view of that, here's 16, the 16 chromosomes, and each line represents a gene. So there's, these genes are just lined up one after another on, on each chromosome. And <coughs> one thing you can do with yeast, because it's so easy to manipulate um, this organism genetically, partly through homologous recombination, is we can go into a diploid, so it has two copies of every chromosome, a diploid organism, and delete one copy of each gene. And then the beauty of yeast is you can take it and convert it from a diploid to a haploid, uh, where it only has one copy of each chromosome. And you can, under those conditions, ask whether that gene is required for life. And so the yeast community did this, deleted each of the 6,000 genes, one by one in a diploid, converted it to a haploid, and asked whether the gene was required for life. And uh, 1,000 of the 6,000 genes, when deleted individually, is required for life. 5,000, you delete them, and the cell basically barely knows it's happened, OK? And this is true uh, not just in yeast, it's in tru true in all forms of life, basically, um, any sophisticated form. So <coughs> in E. coli, uh, in yeast, in worms, and flies, and mice, and in human cells, uh, only a fraction of the genes are required for the basic you know, cell division um, uh, and, and replication of chromosomes. Most of the genes are just, are, are appear to be functionally redundant, 
okay, so that you can delete them and and they must be doing something because they're highly conserved, but uh, there, it looks like there's a backup plan for whatever the role of this is. So a nice example is DNA repair. So there's many pathways that control DNA repair, different pathways, and they're, they're required under particular conditions. But in a laboratory setting, you can remove non-homologous end joining and the cell's perfectly fine, it can repair its DNA through um, homologous recombination, for example. But if you remove both those pathways, homologous recombination, non-homologous and joining, then the, the cell has a problem. So we think uh, a lot of the many of the reasons these cells aren't uh, required for viability is because this, the cell is wired with backup systems. And so that the analogy is it's like a, uh, a finely <coughs> tuned en jet engine where if something goes wrong, we've got another way to, to keep, keep the uh, plane up in the air. So, so I have a question. So uh, why, maybe it's philosophical in, in, in some way, but why wouldn't the cell work on these 1,000 remaining essential genes and have backup? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I've never, I can't figure that out, except to say that, you know, it wants to streamline everything as, as much as possible. And then, but still, then why wouldn't there be a backup pathway for that thing? Um, yeah, and there, there's really only one proteasome. It doesn't make another copy of all those genes and, a, and another, I mean, there's other ways, autophagy and things to degrade proteins, but, you know, the major, essential complexes are things like the ribosome, the proteasome, and the whatever. Uh, to make sure you're not telling us that uh, you had a yeast cell where you deleted 5,000 genes and the no. remaining thing is alive, right? No, no, I think no, there's no. a confusion. No. Yeah, yeah. No, and, but, but that's not like so uh, Craig Venter tried to make the minimal genome, right? And basically, if you read their paper, they tried to take these thousand the equivalent of these thousand genes and see if it would work. And then, oh, they were really surprised when it didn't work. You know, so, yeah. You won't even give me any feedback, will you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> David, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did in bacteria, but they, they basically, their idea was this. And then if you read their paper, they're really surprised to rediscover synthetic lethality. <laughs> yeah. So maybe backup is not the right way to think. Yeah, I don't think it's the best way to think about it. Um, I mean, and it's way more complicated than just one pathway backing another one up. Like, so I'll, sh when I show you, so it's just a, it's just a very simple beginning thought that's not correct. Yeah. Can I just say something yeah. that, for example, some of the genes become essential once you give them other, other conditions, for example, stress. So now yeah. they become essential. So they're not essential for viability, yeah. but they are essential. So there are more essential genes <coughs> for other things. Yes, So it's a, that's The true. number is a little higher, but still, why, did, why they don't have a backup? Yeah. There are some backups, but, you know, and some not. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's complicated, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, anyway, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to explore uh, gene function through this genetic interactions. And this is a, uh, this is a, a term that does not mean a f any, it does not mean interaction physically, okay? It just means like, you know, uh, some kind of more like a mental interaction. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, sex. No, no, I don't know what it means. And uh, but here's here's a definition that a genetic interaction occurs when mutations in two. We'll just focus on two right now, but it could be more. Two different genes combine to generate an unexpected double mutant phenotype. Okay, so if I have mutant A and I know what it does to the cell, and I have mutant B and I know what it does to the cell. When I put those two together, I expect to see both things happening, right? Uh, that's the additive effect of the double mutant. 
but we call it genetic interaction when I take this and this and put it together, then something crazy happens, right? Uh, something unexpected. And, that, and um, so the guy that we all know and love that articulated this to the East community was this guy, David Botstein, and um, he really did articulate this when you go back uh, and look at the literature, and uh, which is kind of surprising because we, we think that we, we, the East community thinks it's been looking at genetic interactions for years and years and years, but it wasn't actually you know, I'm, a grad, I'm a almost going to graduate from my PhD at this point, and this paper from uh, the famous Peter Novick uh, and Botstein comes out, and they're looking for suppressors. This is a genetic interaction of yeast-actin mutations. And so, uh, and this is, uh, this is a yeast cell stain for filamentous actin with uh, rhodamine uh, Someone turn the lights down. Yeah, maybe turn that. Yeah, because that's, 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 that's a good, that's a good picture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, David is uh, the yeast Axton <laughs> expert. But look at that. Look at that. The mother cell, the daughter cell, and we've got these patches here that are David's going to talk about that are all involved in endocytosis, and then these cables that are tracks for mice and motors uh, that build the bud by blowing it up. And yeast only has one actin gene, okay? So this makes it, and it's essential. If you delete it and you don't have any of these guys, the cell can't, uh, it can't form any shape properly and it can't divide. But, um, <coughs> and if you go to a worm, a nematode, they have lots of different actin genes. And so you can't really do this type of experiment with a worm. So what, uh, what Novick and Botstein did was they um, mutagenized the actin gene and this dash one means it's a particular allele, so some particular mutation, and they isolated a mutant that was alive at uh, 23 degrees and dies at 37. Okay, so this is a temperature sensitive mutant and Yeast and, and fly geneticists uh, use this to study essential genes in a conditional way. So we can look, we can grow them at a permissive temperature and then shift to the restrictive temperature and see what happens. Reveal the, the essential phenotype. And one way to think about it, it, but there's lots of different things that happen. The protein might not be made at the restrictive temperature, it might be degraded, but the, the classic idea is that you have a, a mutation in the polypeptide chain that allows it to fold normally at the permissive temperature, but when you put energy into it, you miss, the protein misfolds and you reveal the mutant phenotype. And there are examples of that. So, um, so what they did was they looked for suppressors of actin mutants. And so what happens here is if you combine ACT1-1 and you, you, you basically select for a, a random mutation in the genome that suppresses this temperature sensitivity and you, you identify a new gene that way. And so ACT1-1 plus this mutation the cells are alive at the restrictive temperature. And we'll call this, a this is an example of genetic suppression, and we'll call it a genetic interaction because it is an unusual phenotype. You go from dead to alive, right? You know, that's pretty powerful. And, uh, and since it's a, a gain of a phenotype, we'll call it a positive genetic interaction. But mechanisms, molecular mechanisms are known? Is that specific? Uh, yeah, so when they did this, it was completely unknown. They wouldn't even have known what this gene is. It turns out that it's involved in phosphatidyl and acetal signaling, which is a signaling pathway that can regulate actin dynamics through other proteins, but we probably still don't know the mechanism. Um, but there's some major functional connection between these two genes, okay? And it, uh, this is not that case, but I, like we've been studying some of this, but I'll just show you a, a phenotype. So here's NEO1 and it's a temperature sensitive mutant, so the mutant will grow at 22 degrees. It's, it's totally dead at, at 38. And now if I take that TS mutation and delete another non-essential gene, YMR010W, 
perfectly alive at the restrictive temperature. You know, it's, these are powerful uh, phenotypes. And in this case, I'll talk about later, Neo-1's a flippase that flips phosphatidylserine ethanolamine from the outer leaflet to the inner leaflet. And this thing's probably a scramblease that antagonizes it. And if you just get rid of the antagonizing uh, enzyme, then there's, a, there's another backup flippase in there that can, that can take over. Anyway, that's the kind of phenotype. Um, so, so we have this genetic interaction, and then here's the, here's the fun part. Um, here's another allele of actin, so a different mutation in the actin gene. And when you take that mutant actin and combine it with SAC1-6, the cells are dead, uh, even at the permissive temperature. OK? And um, again, I was kind of trying to look up the mutations. I don't think we understand any of this, right? We should be able to, we should look it up though and try and figure it out. Anyway, so this is an example of the, so this is a cool, this is a rescue positive genetic interaction. This is synthetic lethality, uh, which is a, a negative genetic interaction. So, um, and this is a very famous one that I'm going to talk uh, a lot about. Um, but this is unusual, like mutation, this is viable at 23 degrees. This one's perfectly viable at 23 degrees, but the double mutant is dead, okay? And this, this would say to us that these two genes are working together to control an essential function in the cell, right? And presumably that's actin assembly, and this thing's kind of, this mutation compromises the actin gene itself, and then this uh, mutation must, you know, exacerbate that somehow and have something to do with all the, the whole actin dynamics. Okay, so synthetic lethality uh, is this very simple definition where delete one gene and the cells are viable, delete another and they're viable, but the double mutant uh, is lethal. And this is a rare, uh, a rare event. If you test all, if you take gene A and test all possible double mutants, you'll only find a few cases like this. And, and, and because it's rare, geneticists uh, thought that this must be important and it must be telling us that these two genes are working together somehow in the cell. And what, what David did um, was he went into the literature and figured out that this, this combination of two mutations leading to a dead phenotype has a, a name called synthetic lethality and it was coined by this guy Dubjansky who's a fly geneticist in the 40s. And, um, and, um, and so synthetic lethality occurs when the combination of two mutations either by itself, lethal, causes lethality. And the wild thing is that Dubjansky was working with uh, flies from an outbred population. So he was going out into the wilds of California, isolating flies, <coughs> crossing them to one another, and he could trace a defect in development to an allele of one gene from one parent and an allele of another gene from another parent. And because he's doing diploid genetics, this could not have been trivial, but uh, he was seeing it. And there's a couple implications there. One is that uh, it occurs uh, not just on extreme mutant alleles that we make, we make in the lab, it occurs on alleles of genes that are out there in natural populations that uh, carry natural variation. And therefore, it may underlie uh, a lot of genetics as we know it. So genetic interactions might underlie a lot of genetics. Um, but there's no proof of that. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of combinations of genes. So there's 6,000 uh, yeast genes, so there's 18 million gene pairs. And I'm maybe I'll talk about triple mutants, but there's 36 billion gene triplets, right? So when you start thinking about uh, uh, genetic interactions, combinations of alleles driving inherited phenotypes, there's huge potential for this to uh, take place um, in, any, in any genome. So John uh, Pringle was in, uh, you know, he's famous yeast genetist at Stanford now. <coughs> he was in uh, Hartwell's lab where they developed this sectoring assay and and along with Alan Bender, they carried out the first uh, synthetic lethal screen. And so this, this works. You can set up a plasmid uh, with a gene on it. <coughs> and 
you delete that same gene from the genome, and then you mutagenize the cells, and you look for uh, secondary mutations that make that plasmid uh, essential for viability, so the cell can't lose the plasmid. And so, you know, this guy can lose the plasmid, this one cannot, and so it's probably carrying a synthetic lethal mutation with the query strain that they were looking for. So, it's, so they started off uh, uh, with query mutations in BEM1 and BEM2 that are involved in bud emergence, and they mutagenized those strains with this plasmid loss thing, and they would find synthetic lethal interactions with MSB1. Uh, and, and this was the first screen. It took probably a couple years to find that one synthetic lethal interaction uh, because it's a lot of work. And so um, the beauty of this set of uh, viable deletion mutants is that it opened the door for systematic genetics. And uh, so we could now have a matrix of 5,000 mutants and we could cross any mutation into that whole set and make 5,000 double mutants. Because uh, we can make temperature sensitive alleles of the essential genes, we can also uh, look for synthetic lethal interactions, just like David Botstein and Peter Novick did by uh, uh, mutating essential genes, getting TS alleles, and then doing crosses at a, at a permissive temperature where the cells are still alive. But they carry a mutation that compromises the essential gene function. And so this is where uh, Brenda and I got together because uh, we started to think, we, we knew that the yeast community was creating this uh, reagent set, and we started to think, well, the double mutants are going to be the most fun, and so we'll try and set up a system to make the double mutants. And, and we can do it because yeast genetics is just uh, so easy to do. And, um, and so I often wondered, why did I spend five years of my life studying yeast mating as a, a young adult, when I should have been studying money, right, and making money, like my brothers did? And, uh, <laughs> and then, but in the end, uh, if you study mating, then you can figure out how to make lots of double mutants. So I can't make millions of dollars, but I can make millions of uh, double mutants. And, um, so then you can explore gene function with synthetic lethality. So you can make, you can cross this and this and find these things. And so the way we think about it, and again, this is just a, a model, is that if you have two pathways like uh, homologous end joining and, um, no, <laughs> homologous recombination and non-homologous end joining, and they both impinge on an essential function, you can tolerate a mutation in one because the other's still functioning, or this one, the other's functioning, but a double hit will kill the cell, okay? So this is a, uh, a synthetic lethal interaction, if, and it often occurs between uh, sets of genes that are encoding molecular machines that work together to uh, drive essential functions. So if I remove one component of this machine and I screen all other genes for synthetic lethal interactions, I'll identify uh, synthetic lethal interactions with all the components of the backup pathway. And that's, that's true for this component and this one. So then genes that have similar patterns of genetic interactions are in the same uh, uh, pathway or complex. And so if you have a protein complex, we can often see if these two complexes are working together, we'll see coherent sets of synthetic lethal interactions between all the components of the, of the complex. Um, and they can be strong or they could be weak, but they're all coherent, so we know they're, um, they're true or statistically real. So uh, Lee Hartwell, who won the Nobel Prize for his uh, cell division cycle, he he was really interested in synthetic lethality, and he articulated these two concepts uh, in the, in around 2000, so about 20 years ago. Um, one is that if you uh, have a cancer pathway that's in a, it's a non-essential gene set, and you, you can then kill cancer cells specifically by targeting synthetic lethal interactions that um, take advantage of those vulnerabilities in, in the cancer cell, okay? And, uh, and that works like mad. Everybody's uh, going nuts with this now because when he talked about this, you couldn't do any kind of genetics in human cells, but 
with CRISPR, it's just so, uh, it's so ob painfully obvious that this can be done. Hartwell was arguing you should do it in yeast and worms and flies, and if it holds true, then we'll go and, and you know, test it in mice and, and maybe human cells somehow. But now you can do screens like this and find it. But then the other idea he talked about, uh, which is even wilder, is this genotype to phenotype uh, potential. And so he was thinking of, okay, now we're going to start sequencing everybody. Uh, we're going to get their whole genomes, and then we have to interpret it. And uh, we'll have to interpret natural variation. And if natural variation can combine either as digenic interactions or trigenic interactions, to modulate pathways and lead to uh, inherited phenotypes, we have to know the rules of how genetic networks work, right? Um, and, and we have to figure out how, how prevalent it is. So, uh, and that's, that's a wild idea. And I've, I've drunk the Kool-Aid because uh, we write our grants and we cite Lee Hartwell's paper all the time and we say, this is why we sh you should give us money uh, to do this. But there really is almost no, in, no evidence of genetic interactions in, uh, associated with human genetics. And the reason is uh, because it's a, it's a statistical game, game that we can't win. 20,000 genes, 200 million possible gene pairs, and if you look for, a, say, 1,000 people in a GWAS study, you just don't have enough statistical power to find a single genetic interaction. Uh, and even more than that, when you think, when you think that if, it's, if the genetic interactions are mapping, uh, say, two different pathways that impinge on you know, something that's important for uh, disease state, then there's many different pairs of genes that will lead to the same phenotype. So you're trying to find multiple different pairs of genes that are associated with a, a disease state, right? And so that, that's another thing. And, and, and uh, Eric Lander, so there's this missing heritability for any, any human disease, and this is where I don't know what I'm talking about very much except for what I'm saying, uh, so bear with me on that. But if you have, for any disease you look at it, usually we only can explain about 20 to 30 percent of the heritability. A, a lot of it's missing, and you know, there's many different thoughts about this, uh, that it could be rare mutations, blah, 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 you know, we just don't know what's going on. But it's quite possible, and, and it looks from yeast models, that uh, definitely genetic interactions are going to be some significant component of that. Um, that being said, there's almost zero evidence for it. And Eric Lander walks through this. This is why, he, instead of calling it the missing heritability, he's, he's calling it the phantom heritability, as if the variation is there. We've documented it. We just don't know which combinations are leading to the phenotype. But he, he uh, sort of goes through the math and says to find one particular genetic interaction, you'd have to have around 500,000 individuals. So someday we'll have that when our sequences are on our phone and all our records are being monitored by Google or something. But, um, but there's, there's other ways maybe to get at this. And uh, our collaborator, Chad Myers, has, a, has a, some ideas. And I'll, if I get to that, um, we can talk about it. But uh, so anyway, we started, be based on Hartwell's suggestion, um, basically, and just the, the pure uh, you know, fun of it, we decided to try and make all possible double mutants in yeast. Charlie, we are yeah. halfway. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm definitely going to skip some things, but yeah. <laughs> and so, but I can go to the highlights. Anyway, we, we, we really, uh, Amy Tong was a graduate student who started this. She's not on this picture, but then Michael Costanzo took it over. We have a team of technicians, and they feed uh, these locally designed machines uh, to just make all the double mutants. So we can just replica plate, and it works. <coughs> the computational analysis is, is the tricky part, and Chad Myers was in Olga Troinskaya's lab at Princeton. Um, and he has a team of uh, postdocs, graduate students. Anastasia uh, was a graduate student in, with Brenda and I, uh, and she's now at Calico. And these guys really formed a team. And it's, it's very simple. Um, uh, our model for 
you know, how to score a genetic interaction. If you delete a gene and you reduce the growth rate, but you don't kill the cell by a defined amount, so that's, this one reduces it to 0.7, delete this gene, reduce it to 0.5. If I delete this gene in this background, I expect to see a reduction of fitness by 0.5. Okay, that's our, that's our working model. So we, the, the uh, fitness of the double mutant, the combination of the two single mutants, we expect to lead to a phenotype of 0.35. So synthetic lethality, if the double mutant is dead, then that's a negative genetic interaction. But if the double mutant grows better than uh, we'd expect, that we call that a positive genetic interaction. So we quantify negative and positive genetic interactions. And we, we do it just by looking at colony size on a plate and there's all kinds of systematic errors that we, we go from noisy data to data where we, we normal where we you know um, normalize all this stuff out and get at the true genetic interactions. Um, so then, basically, what we get is a vector of negative and positive genetic interactions. So I delete gene A, and if it shows a positive gen genetic interaction with B or with C and then negative for these other guys, I, we score it and we quantify it. And uh, we do that for, we cross gene A to all 6,000 other uh, mutants, and, and then uh, just, <coughs> just score these things. And you get basically, you know, here's an example. So RAD52 is involved in DNA repair, and we get negative interactions with all these <coughs> other genes that are very, have very well-defined roles in DNA synthesis and repair. So you, you connect, in general, functionally related genes. I mean, there's noise in the data, and if the gene is a signaling molecule that controls many different pathways, then you connect that that signaling molecule to many different pathways. But if you're a focused uh, player in the cell, then you, you end up uh, connecting it to other focused players in the cell. And so genes, genes that are in the same pathway have very similar genetic interaction profiles. Okay, so that's simp it's easy for us to define functional modules because we just cluster the genetic interaction profiles and if we have two pathways that are uh, backing each other up, then we'll see that they share synthetic lethal interactions and that it's a coherent set. All the components of each pathway will, you know, most of them. Uh, there's always some false positives and false negatives in our noisy data, but we'll see lots of connections more than you expect by chance. I've drawn uh, positive interactions between these components because if it's a non-essential pathway, that's what we see. And, and that's, this is just because of our model. Um, uh, basically, if you, if you have a non-essential pathway, you kill the pathway if you delete a component, and then the double mutant looks just like the single mutant, okay? So the double mutant will look just like the single mutant, not like what we expect. And so we score that as a positive genetic interaction, just simply uh, part of our model. But um, if it's an essential pathway, you can, have, you can have two essential pathways backing each other up. If you combine two TS mutants in the same pathway, you often, the, the cells often die. So you see negative within and negative between. So we look for these types of uh, network motifs, and I'll come back to that. But in order to create that, that graph I showed you at the beginning uh, of the talk, the thing that I was referring to as the model of the cell, what we do is we just measure the Pearson correlation coefficient of the similarity between two genetic interaction profiles. So A and B, Pearson, they're you know, very similar, Pearson correlation of 0.8, so we connect them by a short, uh, a short edge. So all these guys are connected by short edges. These ones are all very similar to one another. They're connected by short edges. And there's some similarity here, so we put a, a longer edge like that. Okay, so we just, basically we create a graph where if a gene has a very similar profile to another one, it's, it's close. And if it's, you know, more distance further away. And, and because genetic interaction profiles are a quantitative measure of gene function, we're basically just sorting all the <coughs> genes in the cell out based uh, on their functional similarity, which we've measured through this 
genetic interaction profile. And um, so that's what creates this uh, map. And over 15 years, we, we put it together. So we started mapping here. And we started quantifying stuff here. So that's why we now have positive and negative. At first, we were just sort of looking at the cells and saying, oh, that looks bad. And um, in the end, we map half a million negative interactions and slightly less positive interactions uh, when we test uh, a bunch of different uh, gene pairs, many of which we tested uh, twice. And then you create these three maps where we have non-essential network. The essential genes are very rich in genetic interactions. So temperature sensitive mutants are on the edge of dying and you can give it another hit and it'll, you'll push it over the edge. The, um, but the, and so you see lots of interactions with them. And it, but again, they, they sort of are often functionally coherent. And so you're, you're talking about genes and they interact with genes in the same uh, sort of uh, essential, com essential roles in the cell. And we can put it together to create this uh, global network. And you can, see, you can see there's clusters of genes that have similar genetic interaction profiles. And these are major, there's hundreds of genes in there. And so we would think, we think these are the uh, defining bioprocesses, the fundamental bioprocesses, set of bioprocesses in the cell. And Anastasia came up with a nice, um, way of, <coughs> of looking at this. So she'll take a node and then she'll go at a certain distance around the node and she'll identify a set of genes and then she'll see if they're enriched for annotations, this uh, gene ontology annotations. And so we can, she can scan 4,300 different gene ontology uh, annotations and look for enrichment on our graph all uh, automatically without, without any sort of human bias, and that's what, <coughs> that's what puts this together. Uh, and so these are all annotated uh, automatically. And so uh, we've got you know, DNA synthesis and repair over here, secretion over here. I'm not showing genes in the middle, but those are the signaling molecules that control many different functions. So they're not enriched for a gene ontology, but there's still, you can see there's lots of genes in here, and they're, they're often uh, regulatory molecules. So this crystallization automatic from the spectrograph. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, this exactly which agrees with what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's completely automatic. Uh -huh. And um, and then we have a website that you can go to, uh, thecellmap.org, put together by Matei, uh, and you can, you know, put a gene. <laughs> so this is one of the ones that John Pringle looked for, BEM1. It it lands in the polarity part of the manus er, uh, landscape. You can look at all its negative interactions, uh, all its positive interactions. You can dial them, dial them up on the, on the um, stringency test here. You can annotate it. We have a feature there where you can say, uh, what are the enrichment of all the genetic interactions for BEM1? And there, you can see they're all basically hanging out in the, in the same uh, bioprocesses, cell polarity which is what you expect for functionally coherent interactions. There's this tRNA modification system that is highly linked. We don't know how or why, but it's linked to polarity, and we often see it coming up. You can get a, a list, a ranked list of genetic interactions uh, from the most extreme negative uh, going down. And this is, this is kind of wild because here's Here's the one that um, uh, Alan Bender and Pringle identified. It's right in the middle. So you can see, like, when you do a screen, you know, there's hundreds of interactions where you find a few. It's just hard to, it's hard to uh, find them. And so systematic genetics just totally uh, changed the game. Um, okay, so insight. So remember here, these genes have similar patterns of genetic interactions. But we can also look at the genetic interactions themselves. And so we view the cell like this, where if you know there's a, a machine in the cell, we now want to know all its synthetic lethal interactions, or cases where you delete something else and there, there really isn't uh, the double mutant uh, phenotype that you'd expect. So a positive genetic interactions. That could be suppression, or it could just simply be that the double mutant you know, isn't quite as sick as we'd expect. 
you know, so here's origin replication complex, synthetic lethal with these other genes involved in uh, DNA replication, but positive interactions with the TOR uh, signaling pathway, right? And we would argue that uh, this is the kind of wiring diagram that we want for uh, all human cells, right? So that when we go into a tissue, we know what the wiring diagram is. And then if we have someone's personal um, genome sequence, we could start to interpret variation that when combined might lead to collapse of a pathway in a disease state. Or maybe uh, it's not that big an issue because we've got another mutation over here that might lead to suppression or something. And so that gets us back to this Hartwell idea of genotype to phenotype relationships. And this is what Chad came up with. So Chad's, Chad's developed this thing called Bridge. It's, uh, there are some papers published on it. The major paper is uh, still out for review. But uh, because we have these modules in the cell where one pathway or one molecular machine backs up another, Chad decided that maybe what we should do is instead of looking for a particular genetic interaction that we could gain statistical power if we monitor variation that uh, co-occurs but links these two pathways more than you'd expect by chance. Okay, so by taking all the genes in the cell and and dividing them up into functional modules, right, and then looking for connections more than you expect by chance between these subsets of genes, these modules, you gain statistical power. So we look for pathway, pathway connections. And <coughs> you only look for pairing with these moduli, right? Yeah, just the two modules. We say, how often are the genes? Uh, between modules. Yeah. Okay. So here's an example. Here's uh, some, you know, here's some pathway in a, in a human cell a bunch of different genes involved in it. And here's another signaling pathway in a human cell. Again, a bunch of different genes, okay? And then <coughs> we look for connections that co-occur that are associated either with the um, control cohort or the disease cohort more than you'd expect by chance. And in this particular case, we're linking, um, you know, this secretion pathway, which is perfectly reasonable for something like Parkinson's and neurodegenerative disease. We only expect 1,500 interactions, but we see on the, on, on the order of 2,200, 2,300 interactions. So that's the data that uh, we're starting to get. And, and uh, it's not, you know, you have to validate it. Uh, no one believes it. Um, it's, it's basically a nightmare. But uh, from, our fa from our fantasy world, we're uncovering the genetic wiring diagram of humans using human, human um, you know, genome sequences. And, um, and so, you know, maybe this is true, right? Uh, but we have to, we have to and, but no one will give us money to do it. Uh, so we could be on the edge of uncovering something awesome about human genetics that nobody knows, and nobody will give us any money to do that. Again, you said, uh, how do you do the basic sequences? Just on the basic sequences you find this interaction, and what's the idea again? Uh, the idea is that, okay, say you have Parkinson's, yeah, uh, I mean, I hope I can, oh no, what am I doing here? Oh, no, I'm going for it, okay, sick. yeah. So, so this is based on sequences? Yeah, this, well, this is uh, GWAS data, so it's, it's genotyping data. Uh, it's not, but it could be whole genome sequence. It, you know, all you have to do is map uh, variation. Yeah, the GWAS is a little bit trickier because you don't know if you're right on the gene. But there's, there's uh, variation here and variation here. And so that's an interaction, right? And, and you have to have null hypothesis models. And yeah, yeah. And then you look for covariation that is, is associated with either the healthy. But how systematic are those, yeah, for Parkinson's? the same variation, yeah? Yeah, I mean, we're connecting these pathways more than you expect by chance, and you try and go into two different independent yeah. disease cohorts, and if you see it replicate, maybe that's, that's true. Um, Do you know that there are three studies on synthetic interaction in you, using CRISPR in human cells? Yeah, there's, yeah. Yeah, so you could use them. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know what, what human cell is the best model for yeah. Parkinson's, but uh, yes, that's what we need to do. We need to get into a system where we can find it in, in uh, human genetic data and then validate it in, a, in some kind of model. <clears throat> that's what we need to do to convince someone to give us money to do this. But anyway, I want to get back to this modeling the human cell stuff, and so I've probably got 10 minutes. But you can take this and take the best genes and make a hierarchical uh, cluster. And then we can look at the clusters at various levels in the hierarchy. And if you go down to the, the most refined sets of clusters, you can barely see them here. They're so refined. These are all these complexes and pathways that are identified um, using genetics and protein-protein interactions. If you go up to here to these larger clusters, now, these are these bioprocesses in the cell. And then we'd always look at this and realize that, you know, all the secretion guys are together and all the stuff in the nucleus together. These larger clusters that you see in the hierarchy, they're the uh, compartments in the cell. So, uh, you know, the wild thing here is we've just measured single mutant fitness and double mutant fitness, and then we draw this graph, and it basically reveals complexes and pathways, bioprocesses, and, and compartments um, uh, s simply from its, its layout. So then once you have that model, we like, we like to view the cell or the, the graph like this, where you have these big bioprocesses. So we can say, where do genetic interactions occur? Do they occur within a a complex or pathway between uh, complex or pathway in the same bioprocess, between those in, in different bioprocesses but within the same compartment, or are they, are they distant? And it, we get different answers for negative and positive genetic interactions. So the negative interactions are often associated with func um, functional specificity uh, in that they occur you know, in the same bioprocess or between processes in the same compartment, the positive interactions are often distant. And in our SGA, the positive interactions we, we measure are, are not super strong. They're not suppression in general. They're mostly regulatory things. So a lot of them <laughs> have to do with cell cycle regulation and proteostasis. Um, and the reason we're not looking at suppression is because we're, we're just starting with loss of function mutations. We're not looking for suppress, special suppressor alleles like, like uh, David Botstein and Peter Novick. Do you do all these under one condition? All the yeah. Yeah, so we, uh, because it was like, you know, just one pass that took us 15 years, we only did one condition. <laughs> and, and so... But that now we're sampling on different conditions to try and see what the condition effect uh, will be. And so, so it's a good point. But there's all these other types. So everybody goes, hey, now what are you going to do uh, now that you've done that? And, uh, but there's a million things we can do. Uh, conditions, as you just pointed out. We can really attack suppression. Uh, this is something that uh, David's interested in. He did the first complex haploinsufficiency screen, and we are doing that, and it's a total nightmare. I'll have to tell you about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but and then there's this higher order interaction stuff. And so I've, I'm just going to quickly go, just so you can see it, Yolanda uh, published this paper with Fritz and I and, and Brenda, where she did a, a literature curation of all the yeast suppression interactions. Um, and then we also mapped uh, several hundred sp new suppression interactions that were just made uh, when we were, when we were you know, doing all this other stuff. And from that, she can put together a network and show you how powerful it is. Because now you have direction, like mutation here is suppressed by a mutation over there. And uh, she just got a job in Lausanne, so we're very proud of her. Um, and suppression guys, though, are real severe versions of the positives that we score by SGA. And the point is that, uh, you know, you've got a sick individual, but if you, some people walk around uh, and they carry severe disease mutations, but they're perfectly healthy, okay? And uh, so we want, everybody wants to figure this out. 
And, and the hope is that when you figure out the genetic mechanism that you can develop a drug. And there's this cool paper by Steve Friend where they actually looked at uh, this, uh, this situation. They can find all kinds of uh, people walking around that carry severe um, genetic disorders. Um, okay, so this all makes sense. Suppression Suppression interactions are more functionally related than the stuff we score by SGA. Uh, there's no point in going through all this stuff. Okay, here's the one we should, we should go through. Um, okay, so once we have, we, ha we have a system now where we can clone temperature sensitive alleles of all the essential genes onto a plasmid. We can put them into a diploid that's deleted for the gene that's on the plasmid. We can convert that to a haploid where the, the essential gene is deleted, but it's, the cells are alive because they have the TS allele on a plasmid. We can shift this strain to the uh, restrictive temperature, find an extragenic suppressor, and then we can ask, can we kick out the plasmid? So can the suppressor actually bypass the deletion allele? And how many essential yeast genes in yeast can we delete and, and actually bypass with a suppressor? And so this, uh, I like this one because I could bet uh, my colleague, Fritz Roth, yeah, head to head, tete a tete, moi versus uh, Dr. Fritz Roth, right? Yeah, head ahead. So what it, I bet Fritz, and Fritz is one of these guys that if you just lay a number out there, he'll go, eh, I don't think so, right? You know, he's a contrarian. Uh, so I, I laid out a number of 15%, and he goes, no way, no way, all right? How much money did you bring? <laughs> I think I bet him a bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. Because, you know, when someone does that, you start to second guess yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and so Yolanda did this in a, as a collaborative project with Fritz. So she, uh, we've got a, you know, a thousand TS alleles covering, you know, a lot of the essential genes. She gets a bunch of suppressors, so, and we're sequencing all these things now. And in the end, uh, she could bypass 124 uh, genes. Eight, and, eight million CFs. and so guess who wins the bet? Yeah, that's what we're talking. Right, right. And uh, so that was fun. Um, and the reason I made that bet was because uh, the essential gene set is the same in Servicier as, as it is in Pombi, almost identical, even though they are hundreds of millions of years divergent, um, and except for 15%. So there's 15% uh, of the essential genes are different. And, and we can see that that, in fact, uh, it's, it's that set that uh, is non-essential in, in Pombi that um, can be suppressed largely in, in Servicier. So, so it kind of all uh, fits. All right, so the last thing I'm just gonna say is Elena has been looking at trigenic interactions and it's the same game, uh, but we took quantitative features of the digenic network uh, to pick double mutant queries. So they either had high, high degree or low degree. Uh, they either had very similar profiles or weak profiles, which is a measure of functional similarity. They either, the queries either <laughs> showed a negative genetic interaction, a low one or a high one. And again, the, the genes in, in the same pathway. Um, uh, if it's an essential pathway, often have uh, a strong genetic interaction. Anyway, so she can map trigenic interactions, and they have the same properties as digenic interactions. They occur amongst genes in the same bioprocess. And I'll show you an example of one. So here's, um, uh, there's a trigenic interaction. All three genes are mutant. In the other cases here, it's either a single or a double mutant. And so, and there, you know, there's a little bit of action going on, but the, the trigenic is the one that falls apart. And when we look at these uh, interactions, they're, 
they, so the two query genes that we mutated are involved in secretion. And here's the double mutant query. It shows a bunch of secretion interactions, or these black and blue guys, but it branches out into DNA uh, synthesis and repair. And this is often what we see, is that many of the interactions are, are connected to the function of the query genes, but uh, the trigenics are a little broader uh, in, in specificity. And so the, the bottom line is that <coughs> the, the ones that trigenics are enriched for uh, genes that have these particular properties on the diagenic network. So they occur often at the level of complexes or pathways or within the same bioprocess. They often uh, modify a, a previous diagenic interaction. So the trigenic network is built up upon the diagenic one. Uh, but the, the amazing thing is that uh, while there's half a million diagenic interactions, there's a hundred million trigenic interactions um, in a yeast cell that we can predict. <coughs> so so the, when you get in the bioprocess there, if they don't show a diagenic interaction, you can start combining two or three things and you, you cause enough havoc in that bioprocess that you, you create this unexpected phenotype. And so we think that you know, understanding the bioprocesses of human cells and then looking at variation you know, uh, in genes in the same bioprocess might allow us to start looking at inherited phenotypes. And so with that, uh, I will just stop and then maybe ask, have one, one question or something. Thank you. Questions? Do you, how often you, is aneuploidy a problem? I mean, do you see aneuploidy coming up as a, as a way yeah. of suppression? Yes, a, a lot. You see aneuploidy a lot in, in suppression. And there's, of course, there's a fitness cost with aneuploidy. Cells don't, don't like that. But when you go from a, a really sick cell, you can you can suppress it with aneuploidy. And how stable is the aneuploidy? Uh, that's a, I don't think we've looked at that, but by the time we get it and sequence it, you know, it should be pretty, pretty stable. Uh, but we've never tried to evolve beyond that. But yeah, you see, it, it definitely comes up all the time. And we'll see, we even have this one case where the genome well, it's with the signal recognition particle. So you can take all the components of the signal recognition particle and you can delete them and bypass it. So there's some other way to live without it. And the way the cells do that is they duplicate the genome and then they lose a chromos one chromosome. Yeah. So <coughs> is there a way to estimate how often you would miss interactions? Um, yeah, so there, like definitely with suppression, because we look for suppressors more than once, you can draw a graph and figure out whether you're saturated or not. Um, we do have an estimate of the false positive, false negative rate, which is surprisingly high, and we bury that in the supplementary data, but it's around 30% for both of them, 30 or 40%. Um, and I'm sure we could do a better job at it now if we looked at it more carefully, but that's about how often we miss interactions. So, okay. so you, you look, so, so oh, we sorry. have three, yes, no more than three, quick questions, one here, then up, okay. and then we have two more. So Botstein likes to say that the <coughs> allele-specific suppressors would tend to be the specific ones. I'm, I'm wondering, do you think, in general, the bypass suppressors tend to be less specific? For example, I know in bacteria that if you have a secretory defect, a mutation that will slow the growth of the cell will suppress that. And you, and you wouldn't tend to argue that that's really a right. specific, that you've got a specific pathway. Uh, they're, no, they're, I mean, most of the bypass guys are pretty specific. And partly because I don't think this, we're picking up weak suppressors. We've selected for pretty strong suppressors. But yeah, I don't, I'll, I'll dig it out. But yeah, Yolanda's done all that analysis and 
in general, they're really, they are very specific. Yeah. I know, it's just like that other thing we were talking about today on the train with the dots. He doesn't believe me, does he? <laughs> So one side is the of your analysis is the growth rate and less growth of molds. But other side too, to put them in a pathway or in a compartment, it depends on the GO. Yes? On the genetic yeah. Oh the, the profile. What is this? I, I just wanted to put it out what is this based on? So the uh, okay, so when, you, when they, they cluster together because they have a similar pattern of genetic interactions, then they're placed side by side on the, on the map. And then we can go, all the yeast genes are annotated by the curators at SGD. And so that's an independent functional annotation. And we can <laughs> scan their annotations and see which ones are enriched in the clusters. So the functional annotations are based on individual <coughs> studies or yeah. individual genes. Yeah, and a curator. So to bring the other side of the equations. Uh-huh. Yeah, and if, if they had used our data to create those functional annotations, it would be circular reasoning, but they don't use our data. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, um, you said 15 years of uh, experiments with one condition. You said yeah. you started to evaluate how things would regroup and rewire if you yeah. change conditions, then can you comment on that? So, uh, what we've done is we've taken, you know, we have that, those thousand genes that are in that, that hierarchy that behave really well in our assay. We now put those on an array, and then we, we cross in a bunch of, you know, genes from every bioprocess. So we make double mutants, and then we, change, we do that under a bunch of different conditions, salt, um, you know, different carbon sources, you know, all, you know, drugs in the plate. And there's a few people who've done this out there, Trey Eidecker, with DNA damage uh, conditions, and they've really emphasized that the network is, is uh, changes quite a bit, that it's, they call it a flux network. But uh, the, what we find is, uh, that the core network doesn't change at all. If you're a, a, a really solid genetic interaction under standard laboratory conditions, you know, you're a solid genetic interaction even if there's DNA damaging uh, agents in there. There's going to be some genes that maybe aren't even act active under, under laboratory conditions that need, need to be induced or something if you add a DNA dam damaging agent. And uh, those probably will show different, <coughs> different genetic interactions, but they're not the majority. So the core network, just like the essential gene set is highly conserved from Cervici Pombi to Cervicier, we think the core network is going to be um, solid under different conditions, and then there'll be a few uh, genes that are, that are changing. All right, then Andre <coughs> negotiated one last quick question. Yeah, very short question. <laughs> Uh, what you showed is uh, big biology, big data. Um, did, you, uh, did you try to identify one, for instance, one single transaction path and to validate it? Because uh, yeast is very interesting, but yeah. maybe if you validate, there are many single transaction paths known in nematodes, in drosophila, mm -hmm. in mouse. So then you could check directly and validate up to yeah. evolutionary. Oh, I see, yeah. I mean, there's... Human, you're speaking of human disease. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, yeah, I know, but uh, yeah, there, you know, in that database, there's all kinds of uh, autophagy pathways, signaling pathways, uh, amino acid transport pathways. It's, it's all in there. Um, but, uh, and we put that stuff in our papers because we have people that, won't believe that we're biologists unless we show them some real biology. And then and they always try and tell us to take it out. And we go, no, we've already done two years of work on that. We're not taking it out. Yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's definitely in the, in the data for sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. Again.